today. I want to set up a little bit of the series that I want to start next week. I'm going to call it Focus. We're going to study Hebrews chapter 11 carefully. We're going to take about 14 weeks to go through Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at the characters in there and uh, learn and, uh, and study the subject of faith because we want to be focused. And so next week we're we're going to just uh, begin that, that, that series. So if you want to read Hebrews this week and Hebrews chapter 11 and specifically, uh, you can start doing that. Because when we talk about faith, you've you got to think of one thing. Faith always looks forward. It doesn't look backwards. Okay? Ever. Uh, Moses and all those guys and Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. It always looks forward. So we want to just walk through the characters of the Bible and see what we can learn from them so that this year at, at, at Grace is a year of tremendous faith and learning to trust God uh, with our future and taking steps of risk and doing things to, to just move the church uh, as much as we can forward to trust in God to just bless the efforts. So I, today I'm a little bit of setting up where we want to go in the future uh, in the next couple of weeks. But I also want to do this today. I just wanted to go into chill out mode with you. Uh, and just more of devotional than a message today. Can I do that? If you're okay with that. Uh, and I'd like to go back to the Old Testament to Ezekiel chapter 16. If you want to take your Bible and turn there, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And I thought today I would just look at this chapter, learn from it, and just as I read it and went walked through it, I thought, what if? What if? And so I'll kind of challenge you. What if, what if we live with a deep gratitude and loyalty for our salvation? What if? What if we were recaptured again as individuals by the reality of what God did for us in our life? What if? In Ezekiel, God addresses uh, the nation of Israel as a group. As they, were, they were just messed up bad. Okay? In fact, when Ezekiel is writing and when he's prophesying, he's living in captivity in Babylon. Uh, and so the chapters that are written and the prophecies that are recorded are being given to a people who have been displaced from living in Israel to living over in what today is modern-day Iran. Babylon was there. And, and so they're away from home. They're slaves to a foreign people. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of, uh, of Babylon. And the nation of Israel has been taken into captivity because their relationship with God eh, it just wasn't what it was supposed to be. And God says, I need to teach you a lesson. You need to learn the lesson. And in Ezekiel chapter 16, it's really, a, it's really kind of a summary of it. It's a neat chapter. And he kind of is beginning to, he, he's chewing the nation of Israel out, and he's saying, you really need to get this corrected because you've lost the wonder of your salvation. You've lost the gratitude for all that God did for you. You, 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 you lived in Israel, and you had it so good, but you just took it for granted. And you lost that appreciation for what you had. So easy to do, isn't it? And you get mad at them and say, you know, well, they messed up, but you know, what if? What if in our lives we've been saved for, like me, for 60-some years? Got saved as a five-year-old kid. I wasn't a drunk. I wasn't, you know, I, I, my testimony isn't one of, you know, I was doing drugs and, you know, I was into pornography and I was into drinking. 
I was five. I was five years old. I hadn't learned that stuff yet. I hadn't been exposed to that, but I did know one thing. I was a sinner. I could lie. I'd beat up my brother. I'd steal his toys when he wasn't looking. I'd hide them. I knew I was a sinner. You didn't have to tell me that. It's easy after all those years to just forget God's rescue. And that's what Israel did. And that's what we do. But what if in 2019 we lived with a deep appreciation for God's rescue? What if we went back and just said, you know, here's my story of salvation. And we never lost the wonder of it. I think as you get into this chapter, there's a sense of how desperate and helpless we are apart from God. We talked in Sunday school, and uh, what we said there was really wanted to say here as well is this. We tend to think in terms of we need to be models of morality when in reality we're trophies of grace. Okay? We don't model morality. We don't try to be immoral. But we're not models of morality. We're trophies of grace. That's what Grace Church is. Grace Church is not a model of ideal people. It's a, it's a place of desperate people who understand they need each other and they desperately need God. What if we kept that in mind every day? What if we didn't forget that? I think the description of Israel is so incredible. Look at this, what it says here. It says, the word of the Lord came to me. That's Ezekiel. Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices. <laughs> Pretty graphic, isn't it? And say this. This is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. He said, your ancestry and your birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut. Watch how graphic he gets. Nobody cut your umbilical cord, he says. He said, not, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in clothes. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Picture it. That's pretty graphic language, isn't it? That's a, that's a picture that you look at that and you say, can you imagine a woman having a baby and nobody took time to cut the umbilical cord? Nobody took time to wash that baby? Nobody took time to clean that baby and then on, or clothe it? And on top of that, they just pitched it out in the field. Do you realize that's a picture of our life without Christ? The description and, and the vividness with which Ezekiel presents this to Israel. See, do you realize who you were? Do you, do you realize how desperate that baby is going to die? That baby has absolutely zero chance of survival. That's how helpless, hopeless, and desperate that situation was. And that's us. Apart from God's grace, we're hopeless. We're desperate. And so if we could just kind of go into next year desperate for grace, realizing we're not here to be models of morality, we're here to be trophies of grace. Desperate people in need of God's rescue. And that picture is so vivid, but he doesn't quit there. He goes on and he, he shares with his people. He gives a, a, a realization of what God has done and all that God has done for you. Look at these verses. Let's take time to read these verses. Watch. 
He said, when I passed God by, this is God talking, he said, when I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. Isn't that amazing? Live. You know where you were? That was us, guys. That was us. Living our life, to use the imagery here, just kicking in our blood. And God came by and saw us in our desperate, helpless, hopeless condition and said, live. And breathed life into our very being. What, what, what if? What if this year we lived with an appreciation for the fact that we're alive? Look, look at it goes on. He said, I said, live, and I made you grow like a plant in the, of the field. You grew and developed and entered puberty. Your breasts had formed and your, ha you, your hair had grown, and yet you were stark naked. <laughs> the wording of that so interesting. It, 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 the message that God is giving to Israel is very plain and very clear. He said, I said live, but he said, there you stand, fully grown, but you're stark naked. Isn't that interesting in the Bible how over and over again the idea of nakedness keeps coming up and surfacing? And it, it's, it's, it's a picture. It's a, it, it's a picture of, of, that needs to be painted. Of, we, we don't have the clothing needed to stand before God. He goes on, he said, Later I passed by and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, he said, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and I entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. What if, what if we didn't lose the wonder of that? What if all of us could just look at our salvation and understand it's that graphic? That our condition was that desperate? That our hopelessness was utter hopelessness? That our helplessness was just utter helplessness? And what if we just understood that? What, what, what if we understood that we're not going to build the church? We can't. What if we understood our hopelessness and our helplessness and just cried out to God in absolute dependence, say, God, if you don't breathe life into this church, if you don't clothe it, then we'd do well just to shut it down. But what if we believe that just like God breathed life into us, he can breathe new life into a church like this? What if? See, it's just, as you look at this story, it, to me it's just a movie, it, the, the graphicness of it is so vivid that it causes me to get pretty emotional over this thing because if you understand what God did for you and your salvation, that's the picture of it right there. That's, that's what we were. And the fact that I can stand here today and you can be here today clothed in the righteousness of Christ is one of the most incredible things that has ever happened on planet Earth. And what if we just didn't lose the wonder of it? What if we went into this year saying, God, just remind me again all that you did for us and understand how graphic that is. Look what he says. This is the picture of your salvation. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you. There goes the guilt right there. And he said, I put 
ornaments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. I put a ring in your nose. Just as an aside, you may, some of you younger generation may appreciate that verse. (laughs) So if you see anybody with a, you know, the whole nose thing going on, just go back to Ezekiel chapter 16 and realize that when God dressed them up, that's part of it. So get over it and go on. He said, I put a ring in your nose, and he said, earrings on your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. That's that's just a picture of your salvation. Very costly. He goes on and said, uh, your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was honey, olive oil, and finest flour. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty. Because the splendor I had given you and your beauty, perfect, declares the Sovereign Lord. Do you realize, do you realize that as you read those verses, that God is giving a vivid description of what he did for you when he clothed you in his righteousness? The righteousness in which you are clothed as a Christian is very costly cost Christ everything. What if, what if we just live this year with deep gratitude for all that God has done for us? Second thought. We don't have time to read all the verses in this chapter because there's, what, 62 or 63 of them. He said, what if we lived with an awareness of our idolatry. No, me? Yep. You know, the number one sin addressed in the Bible is the sin of idolatry. It's the number one. There's actually two, two. Two sins constantly addressed in the Bible that are prominent. Adultery and idolatry. And we're both guilty. We're all guilty of both. You see, as I, as I stand up here before you, I've got to tell you this. All Ten Commandments, I've broken them all broken them all. I don't know where you are. But as you look at this, there, we need to have an awareness of our immorality and an awareness of our idolatry. Okay? The, the songwriter said it this way, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We're always straying and always heading in directions because we want, well, we want our way. That's called idolatry. And it's actually called adultery. Spiritual adultery is what they're guilty of the two three reasons that Israel is in captivity in in uh, Babylon is because of these two things they committed spiritual adultery and they committed uh, spiritual they committed idolatry oh they didn't make uh, all these little idols to set up they just had idols the Bible calls them idols of the heart and that's where we're all guilty of idols of the heart we have things like pride or things like expectations or you know, whatever they are, but all of us have struggles that we deal with and issues that we deal with all the time. It's why, you know, answer this question, why do you keep going back to the same sin? The answer is because you haven't dealt with the idol that's calling you to that sin. So we constantly go back. We have idols of the heart that have to be addressed constantly. But what if, what if we lived with an awareness of our condition and understood that we can easily get off track. That idolatry is something that during the course of this year we'll all be guilty of it. It it can be packaged in this, I want it this way. See, we don't want a, a church here and you don't want a church here that's a church that fits your model. You want a church here that fits Christ's model of a church. Little things. 
But we all struggle with idolatry and we all st struggle with the issue of adultery because our hearts wander. If I can define it for you, I would say this. Adultery is this. It's to love anything more than God. That's, that's called spiritual adultery. We live in a nation that is very adulterous as a nation. Uh, today, on Sunday, uh, the biggest worship centers, the mega places will be the sports stadiums. And most of it is just because America worships sports. It just, it does. If you go down there, if you ever go to a game, you'll get a kick out of it because there's, they bring their campers, they bring their kitchens, they bring their drinks, they bring it all. And man, they party. By the time they get to the game, I'm not sure they know there's a game going on. The reason they don't care if the Eagles win or lose is... <laughs> They're not in a condition to care. It's only us that watch it on TV, right? It's a sport. It's, it's idolatry. And, and it's, it's adultery if I love anything more than I love God. And you, you have to constantly vote. What if we kept tabs of that? What if in our life we, we just kept track and just made sure that we just keep God right there at where he's supposed to be. That's hard. Look at the verse. He said, you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. Isn't that vivid description? He said, you lavished your favors on anyone who passed by and your beauty became his. You gave away yourself to anybody. You didn't care adultery right there said you took some of your garments and made gaudy high places where you carried on your prostitution you went to him and he possessed your beauty in other words what God is saying is this you love that more than you loved me you know one of the things that's it's, it's easy for us to fall into is Church can be a place of adultery. What if we love church more than we love God? Can that happen? Yeah, it can happen. Yeah. Most of the adultery that is committed by us is not things that are bad things. Most of our adultery is, is, is good things. I, I may love m my church more than I love God. I, I, I may love my camper more than I love God. I may love my car more than I love God. It's good things that capture your heart. And God says when that happens, you're prostituting yourself. You're giving yourself to another lover who's taking my place. That's called spiritual adultery. And God deals with that. What if we just recognized our tendency toward that? What, what if we just said our goal this year is not to love all these things, but to love God most? The other one is idolatry is dealt with in this passage. That, that is to worship anything other than God. It's, it's, it's similar but, th but they're different in, in, in a way because one goes after your heart, the other goes after you worship. See, everybody worships. All of you worship. The question is, who or what do you worship? See, we, we are worshipers. This is where the idols of the heart get in there. I expect this. Expectation is one of the idols that I struggle with the most. I get this is what it ought to look like. This is what it ought to be like. You know, this is how my marriage should be. I don't know what's wrong with my wife. The, the, the problem is the man got an idol of the heart, got an expectation that's unrealistic. And idols of the heart are not good for marriages because I put expectations on my wife that she can't live up to. What if we understood this concept? What if? Well, the elders ought to be this. Yeah, that's an expectation. That's probably an idol. Well, the deacons ought to be. Uh, yeah, 
Yep, they're, they're surfa- there's, the, there's the idolatry and the immorality. There's where it's surfacing right there. Well, I don't, well he ought to live this way. Too. There it is right there. Anytime you point the finger at anybody else, you got three of them pointed right back at you. Right? So anytime you got the finger going this way at anybody else, you have an idol of the heart. What if we came into church and said this? He's not the problem. She's not the problem. I'm the problem. One of the biggest idols I've found over the years of being in the ministry is it wasn't this way 30 years ago. This is how the church used to be. That's called idolatry. That's idolatry. It's worshiping the past instead of worshiping the God of the future. They're all over the place. These idols, man, if we brought all our idols to church with us, if we were willing to lay them out on the floor and show them to everybody, it'd be like ridiculous. And we all have different idols. What if God was the object of our love and he was the one that we worshipped more than anything else? He became the ultimate priority of our life. What, 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 what if? Just, just Ezekiel chapter 16 kind of puts it out there to just, what if? Keep your New Year's resolutions really simple because most times they don't last much past January. And I would, as a Christian, just maybe say, let's focus on keeping our hearts right. He said this, you also took fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver, and you made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution with them. That's how corrupt they had become. And you took your embroidered clothes and to put on them, and you offered my oil and my incense before them. It's idolatry. So what if, what if we just realized that as a group of people, there's just a tendency on our part to chase idol- idols or be adulterous? And what if we say, God, help us to keep you our priority and to keep you the object of our worship? As you wrestle and go through your New Year's and resolutions and think through what you want to accomplish next year, don't kind of keep it focused. Uh, and last one. Last one, that's right. What if we learn to always run toward redemption and restoration? What if? What if we just rent? I've got an issue with this person. Well, go sit down with them. Run toward redemption. Run toward reconciliation. What if, what if we just always learned as a people, oh, I don't like that person. Go, go sit down with them. Well, that they, go sit down with them. What if we did that? Watch this. Striving to honor and glorify God. Because God said this. He said, yet I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth. Isn't that interesting? I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. That's the new covenant, by the way. That's a prophecy right there. Uh, that's that particular covenant. That, is, that everlasting covenant is the new covenant. That's the New Testament laid out in Matthew through Revelation. He said, then I will remember your ways. So what God is doing is, is simply doing this. He's saying to Israel, look what I did for you. Look where you are. But God is saying, I'm not going to leave you there. He said, I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to come after you. Why? Because I established a covenant with you. I entered into a relationship with you, and you are mine. You belong to me. You're mine. What a great truth. God goes after them. And, and what if we, instead of saying that elder or this elder or that deacon or that deacon or the pastor or this, what if instead of saying that, you came and said, 
can I talk to you? What if we always sought reconciliation? We always sought the redemption. Because the truth is here, we're all messed up. We're just all messed up. I just think in church sometimes we're just hesitant to say it. And, 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 and we're going to mess up this year. All of us are. It's okay. We'll still love you. Why? Because we are in covenant relationship to each other. We belong to each other. Well, I don't like how he does that. Go talk to him. Tell him that. He may say to you, but I don't like how you do it either. Can we just love each other and not like how we do things? Yeah, we can do that. I, long ago, for all of you that have been married for any length of time, I discovered long ago in marriage is this. It's two people who disagree with each other on a continual basis who don't let their agreements drive them apart. Come on, don't sit there and look at me like I'm the only one going through that. You can't tell me you as a husband and a wife always get along and always agree on everything. It isn't it? You can't. My, my, man, I don't want to say anything. I don't, I get, it'll go back to her. And then I have to... I, I, but we just have areas where we totally disagree with each other. But that's okay. That's okay. I'm not getting rid of her over it. She's not getting rid of me. What if we understood? It'd be, it'd be fun. We should do this. We, we should do, when you join a church, we should have a blood covenant relationship. We should bring everybody up here. And what we should do is just take out a knife. You know, this in the Old Testament. We won't go into that. Okay, there were means in the Old Testament. The knife came out. There were blood covenants. There was blood shed constantly. So when Christ come and shed his blood, the imagery is vivid in scripture god paints pictures that are like yeah what if when we joined the church we just all took a little knife and cut the finger and all walked up there and put our fingers together and realized blood covenant you can say okay i know you think is you think in disease but what if i'm not saying do that but I don't think we think in terms of we are in covenant relationship with each other. It's a blood relationship. <laughs> Mike and I were talking this morning. I think in marriage, instead of having the sand or the unity candle, you should just have a blood, just get gory. and <laughs> You're entering into a covenant, you're putting your two blood types together, and that's the relationship that you have with each other. That's an ugly picture, isn't it? But we don't understand covenant relationship. God made a covenant with us, and then he sealed it with an oath. He's that committed to his church. But he needs his church to be that committed to him. And we do that by always running toward reconciliation and always running toward redemption. Even in church discipline, it is running for redemption and running for restoration. Because if you're at the point where you need discipline, it, the church comes to you and says, hey, you need come on back here. Come on, get back where you should be. It's only when you make the statement, no way, that we have to say, okay, we have to break fellowship at that point. So we're always moving toward each other. What if we always move toward each other instead of moving and allowing things to drive us away from each other? What, what if we let people experience the hurt they're going through? and encourage them in the midst of it. 
instead of criticizing them for it? What if we felt the pain instead of criticizing the pain? What if we understood this concept? You see, we're always striving to glorify God, but we're always striving to reflect our redemption. He said it this way, So I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord. What if, what if we did relationships in such a way that when the town looked at us, they would say, we know who their Lord is. What if in, in all we did and all we do this coming year, God was glorified and redemption was magnified and all of us say, you will know that I am the Lord. That's a powerful verse of Scripture. So what if we lived with a deep gratitude and loyalty for our salvation? What if we lived with an awareness of our idolatry? And what if we learned to always run toward redemption and restoration? What if? Think it through. As you do your New Year's new stuff and think through the new year and what you want to accomplish, throw the what if in there and just ponder it. Let's pray. God, thanks for the chance just to Look at a very vivid, descriptive, really descriptive, graphic illustration of your relationship to your people. Thanks, Lord, for rescuing us when we were wallowing in our blood. Thanks for breathing life into us and for clothing us with your righteousness. And then, Lord, help us to realize that we're just prone toward idolatry and we're prone toward adultery. And then help us, God, to just run toward restoration, to run toward redemption, to run toward reconciliation. Always in our relationship with you, keeping it clean and always in our relationship to each other. Help us to help those who are hurting. Help us to love those who are going through struggles. Help us, Lord, just to constantly process and realize that you want us to keep right relationships with your people, that we're in covenant relationship together. Not just a commitment. It's a covenant. Far deeper. Far deeper than any commitment. So this cause us to ponder a little bit and think. And as we enter into the new year, Lord, we enter into it helpless, totally dependent upon you, totally dependent upon your resources, totally dependent upon your intervention, so that we can see this year what you want to do in the life of this church, we pray. Bless each one. Bless their celebrations this week as they celebrate the new year. And as they make their resolutions and sit down and set up some goals and whatever they do for the coming year, Lord, bless them as they do that. May they, may they sense and may they know what you want them to accomplish in the coming year, sometimes as individuals and then even as, as, as families here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.